Let's talk about something really sexy. Have you seen my contracts? My real estate contracts? You're probably thinking, well, contracts aren't sexy. Well, you're wrong. You're wrong. Because if you've ever called a lawyer and had him draft a contract for you, when he charges you 3,000 bucks for some contract where he changed like three sentences and just took a Microsoft Word document and changed it, when that happens to you, you'll, you'll begin to hate those guys. So sometime around uh, 2009, 2010, I had a business partner who had a very legal mind. And I said, why don't we put some of that legal knowledge to use? Why don't we start drafting our own contracts, right? And we made all of these contracts for the real estate business. Part of them, part of the contracts were ones that lawyers had drafted for me that I paid for. Part was ones that lawyers drafted for him. And we sort of made the rest of them together. And we put it together in this package called the buyer's briefcase, right? Probably took us a year of working on it part-time to make all these contracts. And then we sold them. And we would put the contracts for the real estate business inside of this cute little briefcase, right? Very sexy looking little briefcase, right? And the idea was to keep it in the back of your car, right? So back in the Back in the day, I had a bunch of contracts that I used to keep in this bag, and I called it Phil's Bag, right? And when we decided to market it, I thought maybe Phil's Bag isn't the greatest name, right? right? So we came up with this cool name, the Buyer's Briefcase, right? And then when Larry and I started this school, all of the contracts that you guys get to use like the trusts and the agreement of sale and the subject to contracts and all those amazing stuff. A ton of work went into that. And all of that stuff is now part of investor schooling. So if you join investor schooling, you're not going to need to call a lawyer because there's no real estate deal that you're going to do that we haven't already done. And we already have the contracts for them. And how do I know that? Because we had to make them. We made them. If they didn't exist, we just made them. So these contracts have been tested time and time again. And I'm going to share with you tonight a story about one of the most challenging uh, contract disputes that I had and show you so you understand the power of investor schooling's contracts. OK. So uh, here's our disclaimer. I'm not an attorney, but I will be making fun of them tonight. <laughs> I am giving advice based on my experiences and successes. I do not claim that anything in this presentation is legal advice, estate advice, or tax advice, but I'll be making fun of some of those guys too. And uh, please feel free to check with your accountant or attorney before using any of these techniques discussed in this presentation or any techniques I ever discuss with you. So I should talk to a lawyer to see if that's actually an accurate phrase. OK, so the power of our contracts. Started out, I get a call from this guy. He calls a bandit sign. Everybody here knows what a bandit sign is, right? I used to litter Bucks County, Montgomery County, Philadelphia area with these bandit signs that said Johnny buys houses. Who's Johnny? Hell if I know. Just uh, don't want to use your own name, you know? A couple of times I thought about writing Larry Steinhouse buys houses <laughs> just to mess with them, you know? But, uh, but I didn't actually do it, but I might in the future. So I remind him time to time that if he messes with me, that's, could, that could be something that happens. So this guy who calls me, he works for a law firm. And uh, his law firm was handling the probate of a guy who had passed away and his family hired the law firm to liquidate the asset, which was the house. OK, so I wrote up my two page wholesale contract, which is one of my favorite contracts, which I was part of creating, which I feel very fond about. And I think it's very sexy. 
if you actually sat down and read it one night when you were lonely, you might feel a little better. It's a hell of a good contract, I'll tell you. Okay. <laughs> so the lawyer is, you know, telling me that he is a junior lawyer. It's how he defined himself. I'm a junior lawyer at this law firm. And um, he lets me know that he wants $10,000 under the table. Okay, so, so he wants to sell me the house, but he wants 10 grand under the table. So what's he doing? He's wholesaling it to me, right? He's wholesaling it to me. So how, how, could I, how could I be mad about that, right? When that's what I do for a living sometimes, most times for years. That's what Evan does. That's what a lot of students in our school do. You get a house under contract, you sell the house to somebody else, you charge them 10,000, 15,000, whatever you can get from it, all right? So now when you're dealing with a client who, who doesn't really uh, have any legal experience, often the two-page contract, it was designed to put it in front of somebody and just make them feel so comfortable because there isn't that much scary things on there to even think about. If you look at the contract, it sort of says, here's the seller, here's the buyer, here's the price, here's the date we're gonna settle, here's where we're gonna settle, here's who's gonna pay the closing cost, here's who's gonna play the other closing cost, sign right here. And most people who aren't familiar with signing contracts, they look at that contract and very, very rarely someone says, maybe like one out of 40 times, somebody says, I wanna send it to my lawyer. And, and my response is, well, you can send it to your lawyer if you want, but do you realize what this contract is, is saying on it? It says you're the seller, I'm the buyer, here's the price, here's the date, here's the title company, here's who pays the closing costs. It's so simple that it's almost, impossible to have an objection. Like you almost, the contract, what it does, why it's so sexy is because there's nothing to object about. There's nothing. What are they gonna complain? I'm not the seller. You're not the buyer. If you agreed on the price, you just write it on there. What, what, what's to argue about? It's really simple, okay? Larry and I together have about 67 years experience. Most of that number is on Larry's side. <laughs> right? Most of it, most of it. So um, Pedro, can you, uh, can you put up uh, item number one for me? I love making people just put things up. It makes me feel important. Okay, so one of the first things that I do when I'm working with somebody, this lawyer, not only does he want $10,000 on the side, okay, underneath the table, he wants me to put $1,000 down. Now, if you look at my wholesale contract, it actually does not say anywhere, there's nowhere to write how much money you're putting down, right? That was my idea. If, if there's no place to write down how much you're putting down, sometimes people don't even think to ask you about that, right? So for example, if I signed a contract with a guy while I was at his house, I would go back to my home office. And the first thing I would do is I would write out the check for $1,000 that this lawyer, this junior lawyer demanded that I pay, okay? And you never, ever, ever, Give money to the seller directly. If any of you do that, you're going to have to sit in that dunce chair that we have behind that curtain over there. You have to wear a dunce cap for a whole night. You don't want to go through that humiliation. <laughs> okay. So when I, would, when I would send the agreement of sale back to the junior lawyer, I would write out the check and I'd make a photocopy of it and I would make it the very front page of the scan that I'm sending to the lawyer. And I send it to him so that there is no question about the fact that I've written that check out for $1,000. And he's, most people would just go, okay, cool. 
he wrote out the check for $1,000 to the title company, right? Okay, truth is that the title company that I work with, which is called Terra Abstract in Warrington, Pennsylvania, they, what I did with them is before I started even using this company, I went down there to interview them. Part of the reason I interviewed them was because title companies used to come to my I buy houses store all the time. And I'd say, can you do subject to, can you do trust? Can you handle private money? Can you do seller financing? And all they said was no problem, no problem, no problem. Until you brought in one of those deals and then there was nothing but problems. So they didn't know what the hell they were talking about. This title company, Terra Abstract, is owned by an attorney. I had a personal meeting with him and the manager of the title company. I asked them like 50 questions, right? To make sure that they weren't lying to me. Not only did he answer the questions accurately across the board, he said, if you don't mind, I'll take your contracts and I'll make some revisions to them, some suggestive revisions to make them even better, which was awesome because he didn't even charge me for that, right? right? So this is the first thing I do. I send them a copy of the check. Do I actually send this check to Terra Abstract? Technically, I don't have to. I have an escrow account at Terra for a thou with $1,000 in it. And I have another escrow account with $100 in it. So sometimes a seller could call Terra Abstract and say, do you, do you have a $100 escrow for Phil Valcone or a $1,000 escrow for Phil Valcone? And Terra Abstract can answer that question, yes. Okay, but I don't send them a thousand dollars or a hundred dollars for every deal. I just have this money in this account. As a matter of fact, if I die, one of you should go to Terra Abstract and tell them that there's eleven hundred dollars there and you're the beneficiary of my will. Okay, All right, because I, 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 I'll probably forget about it sometime. Right, but the point is so I don't have to send them a check. Right, so I write out these checks to make the customer. Uh, the seller feel comfortable about it, but I'm not ever mailing this check, okay? And we actually teach our students not to, okay? Because if you start writing checks, if you're buying, if you're wholesaling on a regular basis and you're buying a couple of houses a month and you're sending like $1,000 or $500 or a hundred bucks to all these people, uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna lose some of that money for sure, right? Just because of the nature of the business. So, uh, Pedro, why don't we go to uh, number two? Okay, so this is the real sexy contract. <laughs> can you, uh, can I scroll it up and down or can you do it a little bit? So you can see this real tiny writing, the lawyer had to change something. They just have to do that. If you hire a lawyer, you could hand them the most perfect document that's ever existed on the face of the earth and they got to change something. That's how they justify charging you $3,000 or whatever they're charging. So one of the changes he made was within five days of execution of the sale of agreement, he gave me five whole days to inspect the property. Thanks, buddy. Um, all right, I could scroll it down. Uh, I gave him a seller's disclosure. That's something where you're, you, you give it to a seller and he fills it out and he tells you everything that's wrong with the house. For example, if there was an oil tank buried in the backyard and he didn't write that on a seller's disclosure, and then you found out that there was an oil tank buried in the backyard, that could be very costly, especially with this EPA, you know, and their, their super powerful organization, which is getting even more funding under the uh, Biden regime. They're going to become a real monster. And um, the point of it is, is that somebody, if there is an oil tank in the background, somebody has to tell you that, right? And if they didn't tell you that in writing, then you as the, as the buyer and you, or even the bank in conjunction with you could sue that seller for not disclosing the fact that there's an oil tank in the backyard. Okay. So that's something, okay. In the, in the conveyance section, when I buy a house, I want to put the biggest possible number on how many days till settlement. 
If I'm doing a short sale, sometimes I put 365 days because short sales sometimes take over a year, right? Uh, the biggest pot during COVID, I would just say 120 days. And they go like, what do you need 120 days for? I said, COVID, COVID, it's so, people are dying and, and the courts are closed and there's a moratorium on evictions. I need this much time. I just wanted enough time to wholesale it to somebody, right? And I'd call them up like five days later and go, hey, I'm ready to settle. Yeah, but this is what you do. Okay, this is the second page of the contract. And in this section, a lot of wholesalers always pay the closing cost. I do not do that. You know, I just don't do it. A lot of people put that in their marketing. They say, we'll pay the closing cost. We'll do this. We'll do that. I don't like to do it. So what I do is I just write on the buyer's side, standard buyer's cost. On the seller's side, I put standard seller's cost. What does that mean? What? I, Whatever, the title companies process 10, 15, 20 deals a day at the title company. They know what the standard seller's costs are. They know what the standard buyer's costs are. And the sellers and buyers are gonna get that information, hopefully the day before settlement so that they can look at the contract. So this is easy stuff. One of the, um, one of the important contracts here, I believe is in section eight. If the buyer defaults on this agreement, all deposits will be retained by the seller as full settlement of any claim. Okay, so what that means is if I don't actually settle on this property, they get to keep my $1,000. Or do they? If I don't send it to them, they don't get to keep it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about this deal because it's an interesting story. So I'm paying $175,000 for this property in essentially Kensington. It wasn't in good shape. And he wants another $10,000 on the side. So I'm trying to wholesale this property for like 195 grand just so I can maybe get 10 grand in my own pocket and I'd have enough to give him 10 grand and a deal would be done. So I honestly tried my best to sell this house. But under the circumstance of it getting $175,000 sale price plus another 10, I just plus enough money for me, I couldn't do it. All right. I just couldn't sell it. It happens sometimes. You get a house that you can't sell. So why don't we go to uh, image number three? At my phone? <laughs> I was going to say, why don't you get the hell out of here, Justin? <laughs> I guess I got to leave. <laughs> All right. So this junior lawyer, I want to emphasize the word junior. Because what he did was he actually wrote a contract, okay? that I have to pay him $10,000 under the table, right? And made me sign it. And I'm like, well, what the hell, you know? I'm not gonna make any money if I don't sign it, so I'll sign it, let's see what happens. This is, this is the side agreement, the fee agreement. John Hart, that was his name. He was the junior lawyer. So let's go to number four, please. I can't sell the house. Lawyers calling me up going, when are we settling? When are we settling? What the hell's the matter with you? Thought you were a professional. I said, why am I not a professional? You know, he says, well, I saw your car. So a wrap on your car apparently makes you a professional. So he was disappointed in me because I couldn't sell his overpriced house, right? So the lawyer starts threatening me. Uh, it's, I never actually talked to this Barry Goldstein. I only talked to the junior lawyer, John Hart. So he's calling me up and he's saying, if you don't settle by so-and-so a date, we're keeping your deposit. I'm thinking to myself, that's going to be a hell of a trick. Are you going to keep my deposit? Because I never sent it, right? Okay. So what happens next? This is a lawsuit sent to me by an attorney. 
the estate of so and so, the owner of the property versus Falcone. I don't mind being called Falcone. I'm okay with that. I prefer to be called Philly Phil, but Falcone is all right. Okay. So it starts out with, um, let's see. Uh, here he says, my client will accept the $1,000 deposit from you. Plus, he spent five hours writing this lawsuit up. And he's charging me $300 an hour for the five hours. Uh, and what he told me on the phone was, he said, this is the junior lawyer. He's, he tells me, he goes, I'm telling you, Phil, this guy, Barry, does not mess around. He will sue you. And I'm like, hmm, a lawyer who sues people. Well, well how, so original. I never heard of that before, right? Right? So what's that work out to? Five times three plus another thousand. So he's basically telling me I got to pay him this money or he's going to sue me for $50,000, right? So let's take a look at this lawsuit a little bit. It's because some of it is kind of comical. So in here, it says parties. He's talking about the, the family of the deceased. And then Phil Falcone is an individual. And then he writes number three. I like number three. The defendant, Sergeant Street Trust, is a non-existent entity. I, I spent five minutes writing out a trust agreement and I wrote the name of the trust on the contract. That's all. So, so what if it's, a, he probably looked it up to see what kind of deals I did and he couldn't find a, a document named Sergeant. He couldn't find a company named Sergeant street trust. So it's non-existent entity. I don't know what that even means. Uh, it, it exists. If I write out the contract, and in here, what else does he say? Uh, you know, the defendant never issued any such check. This is a lawyer writing down that me, I never sent him the check. Does this lawyer understand that if I never send you a check, I never had your house under contract in the first place, right? We never had an actual deal. I never sent him the check. What we what we usually do is we don't send the check. And then a week before settlement, someone calls up and goes, hey, uh, Phil, we never got that deposit check you were supposed to have. I said, oh, let, let me look through my file. Oh my God, I left it in my manila folder. I'll mail it to you right away. Or I could just bring it to settlement next week. What would you like me to do? And that's how you deal with that. And that's how you make sure that you don't lose your deposit money by being very forgetful about sending it. And it might sound funny, but a lot of real estate investors do exactly that. Uh, in here, he's saying, um, <clears throat> in order to mitigate the damages, the plaintiff listed the plaintiff had to list the property again and found a buyer who agreed to purchase the property for a sum of one hundred fifty-two thousand. If he sold it to me for one hundred fifty-two thousand, I would have been able to execute everything, right? So. They're mad at me, and I guess they're saying that I owe them the difference between 175000 which is what I agreed to pay, and 152, dollars which is what they actually got for it, right? So they're upset about that part, too. They're upset about a lot of things. Uh, in here is $50,000 is what they're, they want from me, right? So enough with this contract. You can just... Uh, Go back to the presentation, please. So first thing you do when a lawyer sends you a contract, you never ever call the lawyer who's suing you. Never speak to them ever. I called my lawyer. I called my lawyer around 10 o'clock in the morning. The mail came early that day. Called my lawyer. I said, somebody's suing me for $50,000, blah, 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 blah. Here's the details. I scanned everything and I emailed it to him. He says, uh, I got some time around two o'clock today. Why don't you just come on over at two o'clock? We'll talk about it, right? Next thing you know, 15 minutes later, my phone rings. He goes, Phil, no reason to come in at two o'clock. 
He goes, first of all, you never sent him the money. So the deal was never, you never had the house under contract in the first place. Okay, that's cool. Next, he says, you know that fee agreement where the lawyer was charging the family of the deceased? They were his clients. He said, I could have him disbarred extremely easily. Would you like me to do that, Phil? I said, nah, just squash the thing. That's good enough for me. I said, unless, you know, he starts like messing with us, then we could we could do the hardball thing. But I'm not trying to disbar anybody. I was just trying to make a few bucks off the house. That's all right. So I don't hate the lawyer or anything I, it is what it is. He tried to scare me, tried to intimidate me. It didn't work. Never, never pick up the phone and call a lawyer and, and talk to them personally. You, you have another lawyer do that for you, or you're probably going to lose that situation very, a uh, uh, hold of that situation very quickly. Right. So, um, can you switch the slide? I don't think my clicker is working. Okay, so there's the famous check. Never give the seller any money. That's important. People still ask me that all the time when I'm doing coaching appointments. Should I just give the cash to the seller? Never, ever do that. You put it in a title company and you could leave it. You could actually, if you had to write somebody a thousand dollar deposit or a couple thousand dollars because that's what they wanted, you put it in a title company. All right. And you could just leave it in there for years. And every time you do a real estate deal, you'd use that same money over and over and over again. So that's a much smarter way. All right. So um, my escrow accounts at Terra Abstract are what I use. I told you I interviewed them. I made them prove to me that they knew how to do the kind of deals that I do. Carla is the manager. And if you bring them repetitive business, she takes care of me. She does me a lot of favors. You know, a lot of times I'll go in there, ask her to do this or do that, and she'll do it for me. And she doesn't even charge me because I've uh, I brought her a lot of business personally. I also brought her business from the school. Okay. And I never agree to pay all the closing costs. It's perfectly reasonable to accept that the buyer would pay the buyer's cost and the seller would pay the seller's cost. I don't know why so many wholesalers just agree to pay all the closing costs. First of all, if you're going to write that on your marketing, you're already giving that part away. It, they haven't even called you yet. What's the point? I don't get it. I don't get it. All right. If a guy says to me, do you, do you pay all the closing costs? I say, I'll pay the, I'll, I'll pay the, the buyer's closing costs. Yeah, I'm going to pay half of them. Right. You pay the other half. That's fair. Okay. So, like I said, the lawyer called the bandit signs. These are can be a pain in the butt, but but bandit signs work and they're very, very cost effective. That's why you see them everywhere. So the way we did it was we used Johnny Buys Houses. We used a Google phone number. So if the Philadelphia cops wanted to charge us, hundred dollar a bandit sign fine which is what they like to do uh and some other counties that also have their own fees and, and charges if they catch you putting them up right you use a google phone number so they can't find out who you are right you use a fake name like johnny uh, or larry steinhaus and and you put them up on the signs all over the place and people will call you and you will get leads. You will definitely get leads. Many times this has happened to me. I got a call from somebody saying, uh, yeah, I'm interested in talking to you about selling, selling you my house. And on the way to drive to their house, I passed one of the Johnny buys houses signs. And I said, obviously, that's how they found us. Right. So what we used to do is our people would would go out with like 300, 500 signs in the back of a pickup truck. They go out at two, three o'clock in the morning. They got this tool where you can clip the sign underneath like this um, coiled thing that holds the sign up there. And then it's got a stapler and they bang it against the telephone pole real high up. 
and then they hit it. So the first staple holds it up there and then they'll hit it with a couple more staples. So the whole thing takes like 30 seconds. So a guy gets out of a truck, grabs a sign, bangs it against a pole, gets back in the truck. Somebody else is driving. You go to the next pole, you go to the next pole. Um, you go to different neighborhoods. You can go to major intersections, whatever turns you on, right? I've even seen where they put one on every single pole for the, a very long road, every single pole. So you could actually read the phone number while you're doing 70 miles an hour, all right? People do that, okay? okay. I, I know one of the biggest bandit signs perpetrators in Philadelphia. And uh, if you wanna know him, all you gotta do is call bandit signs in Philly and you'll probably recognize his voice because he answers almost all of the signs calls, all right? But that's how he gets his leads, all right? So um, this is a very effective way. It's a very cost effective way. Now, I never got pinched. I never went out and actually put the signs up. I paid people to do it. I told the people who work for me that they had to pin every time they put a sign up, right? So if one guy was nailing up the sign, the other guy was on his Google Maps pinning where the sign is. Right. And there was a special phone number, a special Google phone number for each of the guys putting up the signs. Right. So if we got a call uh, from that lead, we knew who put that sign up and we would give them not only do we pay them per sign, we also it was like a dollar fifty a sign, I think is what we were paying them. And then they got a hundred dollar bonus if they actually anyone actually called us. OK. And that's kind of how we did it. And we're littering the city with these signs. And then other wholesalers come around. They put their signs on top of your signs. And then we go back and we take their signs and we throw them in, in the woods. And then we put our signs on top of their signs. And it's just, it's just like a crazy game, right? But it works. Will you get leads? Absolutely. If you're tight on money and you want to start your marketing career looking for real estate deals, get up at 2.30 in the morning. And you pick a truck, drive around and put up some signs. You can buy the signs and the staplers. It's very cost effective and piece of cake to get you some real leads. OK, so like I told you, since there were no funds paid, we have no deal. All right. So even though he sent me this lawsuit and I called my lawyer and all that crap, it really none of it was necessary because the one phrase that I read to you is that the only thing I can lose is what I gave them and I didn't give them anything. But if I even if I gave them a hundred bucks, so what? Right. So if you if you keep your deposits very low, somebody insists on a deposit, you tell them I'll give you a hundred bucks. The worst you could lose is a hundred bucks. You don't give it to them. You put it in Terra Abstract. All right. If you never settle on the deal for any reason, uh, uh, you know, maybe this, maybe the seller could get your hundred bucks. Maybe they wouldn't. What's he going to do? Hire a lawyer to sue your title company to get a hundred bucks back. I, I, I don't know that that's really going to work. I don't think the math works out there. Right. So this, this is, is an, an example of some of the things that protect you in these contracts. We have other things in the trust that protect you. And it's important to know that stuff. So I do presentations on the trust. And today I'm mostly talking about the agreement of sale and behaviors that Larry and I have been using for years. And it's because you, you give somebody a bunch of money, you put $10,000 down on some commercial property, you can't get that money back. That really sucks. And that has happened to people here at the school. Uh, because they just didn't listen to us. They didn't ask us about that. So be very, very careful about ever giving anybody a deposit. Be very careful. Don't ever give a seller money. I don't care what they say. There are sellers who, who adamantly argued with me that they get the money. And I'm like, I've been in this business for 32 years. I've never given money to a seller ever. I give it to a title company who will be facilitating the transaction from you to me. End of story. And it's very important that you guys uh, remember that and follow that strategy. So do we have any questions? Yes, Jeff. Uh, what about assigning the contract to 
But what about um, assigning your contracts when you're wholesaling? You need you need a buyer's contract and no, no. All you need is the agreement of sale that I just showed you. Okay. And then you need an assignment. So suppose you wanted to buy a house that I got under contract. I got a house under contract for a hundred grand. You've decided you're going to give me 110 for it, right? So you're going to pay me $10,000 and I'm going to give you the assignment document. The assignment document is uh, just a couple of pages. And what it essentially does, all it really does is it takes me as the buyer, whatever entity I created, Sergeant Street Trust, whatever name trust it is, right? All it does is it takes me as the buyer and this document overrules the agreement of sale. And it says that Phil's company is no longer buying this house. Now Jeff's company is buying it. That's all it says, essentially, okay? And the only other thing on there is how much you're gonna pay me, okay? And that's my wholesale fee, right? And I did all the marketing to get that lead. So I've got cost in there too. Yes, Will? Uh, with Terra Abstract, is it uh, the escrow account, is it under your personal name or is it under your entity name? Well, I don't even remember because I set it up like a couple of years ago, but this is never a problem. They know me, they like me, they take care of me. Right. So you could do that. Anybody here could do that. And, and if you drop, if, if, you know, if they're saying that they don't want to do it for you, just let me know and I'll call them and I'll let them know you're part of investor schooling. They know we have a school. A lot of people from the school have been using them because they just do a good job. 